One is, is we need to reinvest in rural infrastructure. A lot of people don't realize this, but the food system as a whole, so we're looking at production all the way through distribution and sales, uh, restaurant trade, et cetera, is the second largest employer in Ontario. So there's a huge opportunity for job growth in the food sector. We need more investment in rural infrastructure. We've lost most of our processing capacity in Ontario. Uh, Prince Edward County, for instance, in the 1950s was the tomato capital of Canada. There isn't a single tomato processing plant left in Prince Edward County. So we need reinvestment in processing capacity. We need reinvestment in post-harvest handling capacity. I mean, Quebec, for instance, does huge investment. Even places like California, the public sector invests in rural infrastructure. The second area I would look at is regulatory review. Most regulations uh, around the food sector are written for large companies, and they don't take into account the, the unique needs of small companies. I'll give you a concrete example. A good friend of mine who runs an abattoir, uh, he was, the regulator and came we in. Like we all have a friend like that. We all have a friend like that, absolutely. <laughs> the regulators came in and said, you know what? The regulations say you have to have male and female washrooms. And his response was, well, I'm the only employee here. <laughs> well, I don't think I need a female washroom. My wife does come down to the plant every now and then, and she uses the washroom. But you know what? We don't have a problem using the same washroom at home. So why is it a problem here? And they said, no, no, no. The regulations say two washrooms. So he went to put his second washroom in, realized the way the plumbing worked. It was going to cost him $40,000 to put it in. He said, the heck with it. Closed his shop down. So there's like 20 farmers who now don't have a place to process their meat products and, and sell in their, their consumer trade. So we need to review regulations across a whole host of areas. We got to get the incentives right. And so one of the most interesting things that's developed recently, uh, particularly in Europe and also in the U.S. and starting to happen in Canada, is the concept of actually paying farmers for providing society with ecological goods and services like clean air, clean water, clean soil, and carbon storage. And so in Ontario now, we have a pilot project happening called ALICE, Alternative Land Use Services, where farmers are actually taking land out of production to um, create buffer zones around streams or to replant native prairie grass to protect endangered species, uh, to put in bee habitat, mm -hmm. uh, so we, have, so we uh, have pollinator habitat, things like that. And uh, they're paying farmers. It's not a huge amount of money, but it's enough to create a real incentive to say, you know what? you're creating real public value by being good stewards of the land and we as a society are going to reward you for that. And is that a, a time commitment? I mean, do they do that for a number of years or is it long term? Yeah, yeah, it's usually, it's usually a year over year payment. Okay. And so I'll give you an example. There's a farmer I know who uh, has replanted native prairie grass down in Norfolk County and he grazes cattle on it. Uh, and so in a native prairie grass system, uh, one, it provides endangered species habitat, so it's a new way of thinking about endangered species legislation. So right now we regulate that right. at a huge cost to farmers. So here's a way to create to an incentive for them. So as he puts it, society gets my native prairie grass for 10 months out of the year. It stores carbon just as well as trees do, so we have a carbon storage system. It filters water that runs through the streams. We have a water filtration system. It provides habitat for native species. And usually for a healthy prairie ecosystem, you have to burn the prairie off. Well, instead of burning it off, he grazes cattle on it. So now we have grass-fed beef, a premium, healthy product to go into the marketplace. So just little nudges help farmers move in the right direction. Right. The fourth area that government can play a big role in is marketing support. And I would say that's probably the area where we've seen the government move the most. You've probably seen, you know, for those of us in Ontario, we've seen the Pick Ontario Freshness Program right. and the little food land jingles and things like that. My biggest criticism around that would be that we no longer live in a mass market society. I mean, if you think about it, you know, we have multiple cable channels, you know, multiple internet sites. Um, even the retailers have multiple brands and, and things like that. And so most of our marketing support has been for local farmers, or for Ontario farmers anyway, has been around sort of broad support without looking at how we segment marketing support. So getting away from marketing things as commodities and moving more towards marketing things as, as value propositions targeted to different market segments. The organic sector over the last decade has experienced the fastest rate of growth of any sector mm -hmm. in the food system. So double digit growth annually for 10 years. So that's a value proposition of you're going to get food that's not grown with, with chemicals and it's grown in an environmentally responsible way. 
Another value proposition is fair trade coffee, which is another sector, 20% growth annually over the last five years. So that's a value proposition around um, treating farmers in the developing world fairly. Yeah. Another value proposition, you know, in a different way is the corn-fed beef program. So that's a value proposition around quality. Right. We're going to provide you with a high quality beef product. So there's a variety of different ways you can think about value propositions without just thinking a carrot is a carrot is a carrot. You know, the Ontario government has invested pretty significant amount of money. They've got a $50 million program now to promote uh, Ontario food to Ontario consumers. So there's a bit of a push-pull, mm -hmm. if that makes sense, yeah. that reinforces things. And then I would just say the fifth area that I think has huge potential is public procurement. Uh, so if you think of the United States, over 200 universities in the United States now have re procurement policies where they have to source a certain amount of local food for their cafeterias and things like that. Over 16 states in the U.S. now have procurement policies where their schools have to purchase a certain amount of local food. If you go to Europe, it's even bigger in places like the UK and Italy and Sweden, Denmark, where they have strong public procurement programs for local food. And there's huge opportunities. Just think if, if all the hospitals, universities, schools, government buildings all said, you know, we're going to buy 10, 20 percent local food, that creates huge, consistent multi-year demand. Which our experience has been that when you sort of go, particularly in the institutional setting, and you start talking to a food service director and their primary the way they've thought about food procurement has been cheapest price anywhere in the world, just cheap, cheap, cheap. That's all we think about. So when you start to come in and say, oh, hey, there's other values to think about, such as freshness, local, sustainable, that, that equation's like, oh, how do I deal with this? You know, and you want me to do 50% or something like that? And it's like, well, I can't do that. But if you come in and say, you know what? Start with 10%, start with 15%, start with 20%. We'll help you develop new supply chains because in many respects, that's one of the biggest challenges they face is how do I source this stuff? You know, there's all these farmers out here. How do I connect with them or whatever? So once you start building new supply chains, building new relationships and putting that system in place, then suddenly it becomes easier to ramp up over time. And so we tend to, we tend to suggest starting with a smaller threshold with annual increases over time, sort of a philosophy of continuous improvement. At U of T, we did a study at one of their residence halls that has about, I think, a couple thousand students. They, or no, a thousand students, but they serve 2,000 meals a day, so lunch, dinner. And uh, they realized they were throwing out 442 pounds of food a day. 442 pounds of food a day. So the way they educated their students and were able to afford some of the cost increases is they did a whole uh, food waste uh, education program where they said, here's how you're wasting food. They forced the students to start putting their scraps into a green bin so they physically were confronted with how much they're wasting. They've cut their waste in half. Their food savings from that have offset any cost increases they've had from moving to a, to a local food program. So there's some creative ways to go about it to get around some of the budgetary challenges.